Hello and welcome once again to another lecture for Monmouth Roseville High School's chemistry class. In this section we will cover part of section one of chapter five which is about models of the atom. We're going to continue that line of thought a little further. Now as you may recall Rutherford concluded that the electrons orbit the nucleus in about the same way that planets orbit the Sun. Rutherford continued studying the atom with a colleague, Niels Bohr. In 1913, Bohr proposed his own model of the hydrogen atom. Bohr suggested that the electrons orbit in energy levels at discrete distances from the nucleus. You can see that in this diagram, that there are electrons in specific orbits, although there's more than one electron in an orbit, which is a little bit different than we see with planets. Niels Bohr is quoted as saying that those who are not shocked when they first come across quantum mechanics cannot possibly have understood it. Niels Bohr was a student of Rutherford's. He wanted to explain the location of electrons and something known as a line spectrum. The line spectra of different elements differ from one another and he thought that he could explain that with his model of the atom we will investigate line spectra in class. He began investigating hydrogen atoms in terms of energy. Bohr changed Rutherford's model to include newer discoveries about how the energy of an atom changes when it absorbs or it emits light. Now he worked with the simplest of all atoms, the hydrogen atom, so it only had one electron to work with, making it very basic. He proposed that an electron is found only in specific circular paths that he called orbits around the nucleus, and that corresponded to its energy level. As you can see in the diagram, you have a nucleus at the center that's positively charged. You have electron orbits where the electron can be located and it can jump according to his theory between these different orbits out to further out orbits or jump back down in. Here we see only one part of that diagram showing only one quarter of the orbits as they move around the nucleus. He said that electrons orbit the nucleus like planets orbit the Sun Electrons absorb energy known as photons. Photons you can think of as particles of light. And as they do so, they move to higher energy levels because they have more energy. If they have more energy, they can jump out farther away from the nucleus. Because recall that electrons are negative and therefore they're attracted to the nucleus. If they have more energy, they have the ability to move farther away from that positive nucleus that attracts them. When they're in their normal orbit, an electron is said to be in the ground state. But if it absorbs one of these packets of energy, if it absorbs a photon of light, then it goes into an excited state and can jump out to a higher level energy orbital. Now they jump out away from the nucleus to a higher energy orbital as they absorb energy but they don't keep that energy forever. Eventually they can give off the energy, once again giving off a very specific amount of energy as they fall back to a very specific energy level around that nucleus. And so the amount of energy they give off is going to be in very specific amounts corresponding to the amount of energy needed to be lost to jump down to a lower level. That energy goes off as a photon, so it goes off as light. In our diagram over here, we can see an electron is currently has jumped out to an outer energy level because it absorbed a photon of light. But if it then gives off a photon of light, as shown on the left here, then it will fall back in and can be back at its ground state, as shown on the right. So in this case, as energy is given off, this electron goes from being in an excited state at a higher energy level than normal back down to the ground state. Light is emitted as that happens. 
the amount of light that's emitted depends upon the distance between those orbits. And so there's only very specific amounts of energy that are going to be emitted for each element. Here we see the hydrogen emission spectrum shown on the bottom of this diagram that shows the specific energies of light associated with the falling back of a hydrogen atom's electron from an excited state back to a lower energy level, possibly even to the ground state. We see that there are five different lines here that correspond to amounts of energy that can be given off as an electron falls back down to a lower energy level, falling down either one or maybe two different levels at a time, corresponding to different amounts in each case, which produces a different color of light. Now, this idea only explain the line spectrum of hydrogen, but not of other elements. We will investigate an applet dealing with this in class as well. Now, your energy levels of an atom are a lot like rungs of a ladder. Okay, so a ladder has the sides that you hold on to, but then there's also rungs, those steps that you can step up on, as those are called rungs on a ladder. So you can stand on a rung, but you can't stand in between them. So energy levels are a lot like that because an electron can exist at a particular energy level or at the next energy level, but it can exist in the intervening space according to his model. So what we're seeing here on the left there are two different ladders pictured, and that's because the one on the far left looks like a normal ladder with equal spaced rungs, but the one on the right is a better picture to depict the energy levels associated with your different orbits in an atom. As you get closer to the nucleus, they're spaced closer together, but then they're spaced further apart as you're further away. So there's not an equal amount of space between the, the orbits, and therefore, if we were depicting it with rungs of a ladder, we would see different spacings, and that's not a ladder I'd want to climb. On the right side, we can see a diagram that shows this once again. You have a nucleus, you have the one electron around that hydrogen nucleus, and it can jump out to higher energy levels or fall back in. Unfortunately, this picture does not depict the fact that the spacing varies as you go out along those orbits. Now, Niels Bohr said that he pictured electrons orbiting the nucleus much like planets orbiting the sun. But he was wrong. They're a lot more like bees around a hive. They don't follow necessarily very specific paths. New theoretical calculations and experimental results were inconsistent with describing electron motion in this way. In 1926, Austrian physicist Erwin Schrödinger used these new results to devise and solve a mathematical equation describing the behavior of the electron in a hydrogen atom. Now this led to a, the development of a new model known as the electron cloud model, which is depicted here on the right. In the electron cloud model, the electron cloud is, is a region of space around the nucleus of an atom where electrons are likely to be found. So as you can see in this diagram, you see a lot more dots in regions where the electron is very likely to be found and fewer dots in regions where they're less likely. It's, it's shown by density of dots on the graph. Another scientist by the name of Werner Heisenberg discovered that it is impossible to determine simultaneously, meaning at the same time, both the position and the motion of an electron with any great degree of accuracy or certainty. And his work contributed to the development of this idea of electron clouds. Now this is a timeline showing the basic models that we talked about last chapter from Dalton's model through Thompson's and Rutherford's model. It even mentions another scientist, Hantaro Nagaoka, a Japanese physicist, and his contributions to the theory of the atom. 
And here we see it continued going up through the Bohr model of the atom that we've just been discussing and going up through finally the electron cloud model on the right. We'll be watching a video about this in class as well. So what is it that we believe now about the atom? Well first of all we believe that all matter is composed of atoms. We also believe that atoms cannot be subdivided, created, or destroyed in ordinary chemical reactions. However, these changes can occur if we're dealing with nuclear reactions, which are something totally different. Atoms of all elements on Earth have a characteristic average mass, which is unique to that specific element. And atoms of any one element are different in properties from atoms of any other element. So as we look at the modern belief about the atom, we know that it's composed of lots of smaller particles such as neutrons and protons and electrons and those small particles may themselves be made up of even smaller particles known as quarks. We know that most of the mass of the atom is in the nucleus from the protons and neutrons. And electrons are found outside of the nucleus, and that's the electron cloud. Most of the volume of the atom is actually empty space. Our modern description of the location of electrons in an atom comes from the mathematical solutions to something known as the Schrodinger equation. What the equation does is determines the allowable energies an electron can have, as well as tell us how likely it is that an electron could, would or could be found in a particular location around the nucleus. In the model, a region of space in which an electron is likely to be found is pictured as a fuzzy cloud, as seen here. Areas of higher density within the cloud indicate areas with a higher probability of finding the electron there at any particular moment in time. Now to make diagrams easier to understand, the boundaries within which electrons are likely to be found 90% of the time are frequently used. They're referred to as atomic orbitals and they can be of different shapes and sizes depending upon the energies possessed by the electrons occupying them. And that is where we're going to stop for this part of the notes for section one. We will in part two of section one go into the different shapes that they can have and what we call them, how many electrons can be in each of them, etc. I hope you've benefited from this presentation.